So I want to start this morning by asking you kids a question. And the term kids, I'm using very broadly. So if you consider yourself a kid, this question goes to you. Um, so yes, Yuri, this includes you, okay? Just to pick on certain people. But here's the question. Do you ever dream? Do you dream of the day that you will be in charge? Yes. <laughs> Larissa Anderson is definitely dreaming of that day. <laughs> uh, do, you in, do you dream of that time that you get to tell other people what to do? Like, you'll be the mom and you'll be the dad. That you'll be the boss. <laughs> yes. I think if we're honest with ourselves, probably all of us at some point in our childhood had those thoughts. I did. And they usually came when I had been told to do something I didn't want to do by those in authority over me. You are not alone in that desire to be in charge. In fact, you are joining uh, today a tradition that is thousands of years old because the disciples, Christ's disciples, had this same desire. And I could say that you're in good company, except you're not really. Because the context in which we see the the disciples desiring this kind of power and control and authority was not a good, it wasn't a good thing. It's not a good context. Now, I know that we've been away from the book of Mark for over two months. So this is our re-entry back into Mark, the never-ending series on the gospel of Mark. Let's think about the context. We have the beginning of the gospel. Christ comes and he begins slowly to reveal himself, principally to his disciples, but also to the crowds. His popularity skyrockets. And then we get to the turning point of the gospel in chapter 8, when for the first time we have Peter, who we call it his confession of Christ, when he says, when Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, well, you're the Christ, Messiah. And Jesus says, essentially, good for you, Peter, because that wasn't revealed to you by man, but that was revealed to you by God. And then that's the turning point of the gospel. From there on, Christ's focus is on the cross and on the road to Jerusalem. And that road to Jerusalem is a metaphor for the road or the way of the cross. So that's where Christ's focus has turned to the principal reason and purpose for which he was incarnate in the first place. The disciples, meanwhile, during all this process, continue their two steps forward, one step back pattern. Or sometimes it's actually two steps forward, three steps back. Uh, They catch a deeper glimpse of who Christ really is for a moment, but then they act as though they have no idea. And Jesus reveals more of himself, and then they just ignore it or misunderstand it or refuse to accept it. And I just remind you that this theme of discipleship failure is integral to the gospel of Mark. We're going to see that over and over again. We already have seen it repeatedly. And guess what? We're going to see it again today. The passage that we'll continue with is in chapter 10 of Mark. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there with me. Uh, I'll pick up the reading um, in verse 32. But I'll remind you briefly of the immediate context. Jesus has just had this interaction with the rich young man who came to him and said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And all of that boiled down to the question of idolatry. Jesus, who knew this man and loved this man, the text says, immediately puts his finger on the most sensitive idol in the man's life, which was his possessions. And Jesus goes right straight to the point, sell all you have, give to the poor, then come follow me, and you will store up treasures in heaven. The man leaves sad because he is not willing to give up that idolatry, that idol, to follow Christ. And then Jesus draws his disciples aside and they have this interaction regarding specifically wealth and how wealth can be a barrier that keeps people from following Christ. But we extrapolate out from that that there are many idols which can keep us from inheriting eternal life. And if we choose to place those idols in a position higher than Christ. That's the definition of idolatry. Anything which takes the the place of Christ, then those will keep us. They may keep us from inheriting eternal life. 
And Jesus ends that particular discussion with his disciples with the words in verse 31, that many who are first will be last and the last first. We're going to see a little more of that theme today. So we'll pick up the reading in verse 32. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and will spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? (laughs) We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right, my left, is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them? Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I want us to treat this passage today as though it were a play, divided into five scenes. The first scene is the setting. Where are we? We're on the road to Jerusalem, along with Jesus, his disciples, and the hangers-on, the followers. They're following him in fear and amazement at what he's done, at what he's been preaching and teaching. And let's be clear about this idea that Jesus is leading. That's important. Because he's leading the way to the cross. He's not being dragged there. He's not being manipulated onto that path. There's not some outside force that's coercing him. He is leading. He is in full submission to the will of the Father, and he is making his way to the cross. That word, leading the way, is an important word for Mark. We're going to see it used again in the last chapter of Mark, Mark 16. And there the angel appears to the women and says, go and tell the disciples, I have gone ahead of you into Galilee and there you will see me. That I have gone ahead, it's it's translated that way in, in Mark 16, but it's I am leading the way into Galilee. That's an important comparison. The use of that same word is important because we have a picture of Jesus leading to the cross, to suffering, to death, but leading through that to resurrection and to new life and to restoration and to everything that that means for his church. Jesus is leading. And that moves us on to scene two. In scene two, we have the rising action. And what brings that about? Christ, for the third time in Mark, is specific about what's going to happen to him. And when I say specific, this is the most specific that he has been. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Question, is this vague? Was Jesus unclear? 
No, he was not. Which makes the response of the disciples all the more puzzling and heartbreaking. James and John ask this question immediately after Jesus has made this third pronouncement of his death. There's no way they could have misunderstood unless they have intentionally chosen to ignore what he said. Are you familiar with the concept of selective hearing? My sons are masters. They have perfected the art of selective hearing. Just recently, Micah, we had this big deal at our house about media. You know, it's, media has become a verb. It's like, may I media now? Uh, can I have media? Uh, and Micah came to me, can I have media, Daddy? And I said, I will talk to Mommy, and we'll see if later you can have media. So a few minutes later, I saw Micah on the iPad. And I said, uh, <clears throat> Micah, what are you doing? And he said, you said later you can have media. He's got a future as a lawyer. And uh, I said, but wait, did you remember the rest of what I said? What? What? Um, I said I was going to talk to mommy. Uh, You said later I could have media. The disciples have also apparently become masters of selective hearing. Because they have ignored, James and John apparently have ignored everything Jesus just said, except perhaps for the last three words. Rise again. Yes, he will rise. Yes, Jesus is going to rise to power. That must be why we're on the way to Jerusalem. He's finally going to take his rightful place. He's going to overthrow the Romans. He's going to set up the Davidic monarchy. He's, and we're going to be right there with him. Man, we're attaching our, our chariot to his rising star, and we're going with him. That's, we want to be honored with him. We want to be noticed. We want power. We want to be at his right and his left. And this is one more clear picture of the failure of the disciples. And I mentioned earlier that this is Christ's third prediction of his passion. The third time. And after each of those predictions, the disciples do something incredibly stupid. The first time, if you recall, uh, was in in, uh, chapter 8, verse 31. Uh, Jesus says he's going to die, and Peter rebukes him. Don't say that. And Jesus responds to him, get behind me, Satan. In chapter 9, verse 33, Jesus says, again, I'm going to die. Gives them some more details. They're walking along the road. And what are the disciples doing? They're arguing about who's greatest. And now, here, James and John are selfishly, arrogantly, and foolishly asking for positions of honor and glory. To maybe put this in context or help us understand this a bit more, imagine um, a, a, a husband and wife Um, calling their children together, their grown children together, and saying, look, we went to the doctor this week, and both of us have just been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And the children are like, "Uh, can I have the house? Um, Who's getting the car? Can I have the car? But that's the kind of attitude. it's, It's like all of this just completely ignored everything that Jesus has said. So when Peter rebuked Jesus, do you remember how Christ responded? What did he say to them? He described to them what true discipleship looked like. We know those three points so well, don't we? We've heard them so often. What are they? Deny self, take up the cross, and follow me. And here we see that self is still rearing its ugly head because self ignores the suffering, ignores the pain, ignores the truth, and focuses in on what it may gain. Which brings us to scene three, the conflict. And the conflict comes in the form of the question that Jesus asks in return to James and John. And it reveals that central conflict of self versus Christ. Who's going to have the throne? Who will sit on the throne of our hearts? Will it be self? Will it be me? Or will it be Christ? And Jesus asks them, okay, you want the positions of honor. You want to sit at my right and my left? Let me ask you a question. Can you drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism I will receive? Now, let's take a moment just to understand how these two words are used, cup and baptism here. There's an image that kind of flows through all of Scripture of the cup of God's wrath. Um, It's an image of judgment. Um, And it follows through even all the way into the book of Revelation where you see the the wrath of God, the bowls of God's wrath being poured out on the earth and specifically um, 
the uh, prostitute of Babylon who drinks the cup of God's wrath to the dregs. And so this is an ongoing theme. And so the image there that Jesus is saying is, can you accept, can you bear, can you take upon yourselves the judgment that is due to all humanity? Can you do that? Can you do that? Because that's what I'm going to do. And the question of baptism, even today, as we've talked about this before, that picture of death in baptism, of being overwhelmed, of being put under, of being pressed on all sides. And Jesus is asking his disciples, they don't get it, obviously, but he says to James and John, can you die for the world? Can you do that? Can you bear on yourself the judgment of all souls before a holy God? The question is meant to be rhetorical. It really is. It's meant for them to say, whoa, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. We, we, weren't, we weren't thinking. We, we had no idea. And instead they respond with, of course. Of course we can. So to go back to that opening question I asked you when you're looking forward to that day of being in charge and your parents ask you, so you think you, Daniel, can do what I do? Do you think you can do my job? And the kid looks at us and says, of course. You sit at a desk all day. What do you do? It's no big deal. You get to drive. Of course I could do that. But this complete disconnect between reality and what they perceive. What amazing ignorance and arrogance. And to make sure, to make it clear that this isn't just an attitude reflected in James and John, Mark brings the other 10 disciples into the picture. And they're indignant with James and John. And let's be clear, their indignation is not brought about because they are shocked at what James and John did. They're not going to those two brothers and saying, guys, what were you thinking? Didn't you just hear what Jesus said about his death, about his suffering, and we're following him into that? What, what possessed you? How could you possibly ask that question now? You know what the disciples are thinking? Those sneaky brothers. They're always trying to get some advantage. The little John, the disciple that Jesus loves, he's always trying to like gain something over us. He's always trying to sneak in there to Jesus and say, hey Jesus, when the others aren't listening, can I be, first? Can I be at your right? Can I be? And they were angry because they thought these two brothers were trying to weasel out some kind of advantage over them. And the two beat the 10 to the proverbial punch. That's what they're angry about. So Mark's clear, all these disciples, they're in this together. They all have the same attitude. And that attitude, note the contrast. Let's note the attitude of self that's being revealed here in the disciples. They wanted position, not service. They're seeing these as dichotomies, right? Opposites. They wanted position, not service. They wanted authority, not slavery. They wanted to be the ones to enslave others, to tell others to go, to come, to serve, to do. They wanted glory, not death. How can death be glory? And they wanted ease, not suffering. And isn't, isn't that the way of self? And let's be honest with ourselves that in our natural selves, in our fallen human nature, that's what we want. That's what self wants. We want position, not service. We want authority, not slavery. We want glory, not death. And we want ease and comfort, not suffering. And self avoids suffering and service at all costs. Self sets self up as the highest, the best, the authority, the master. Self would never willingly serve or suffer. And it's self in the disciples that ignores what Jesus says is coming and instead grasps after position and authority and glory and ease. Now here I want to back up a moment, just a few lines, and note what Jesus said earlier to James and John when, he, when they say, yes, we can drink your cup, and Jesus says, well, actually friends, actually you will drink of my cup and you will experience the baptism with which I am baptized, but not in the way they thought. 
They chose to understand this to mean that they would be honored as Christ was honored, that they would be lifted high as he was lifted high, that they would achieve position, that when he comes to the throne in Jerusalem, they would be the number one and the number two over the nation under Jesus. But Jesus is warning them that his road of suffering and death was their road too. And friends, this is really important. It's exceedingly important that as members of Christ's body, that we understand this. Because if our perspective on God, if our perspective is on God is that he is a suffering, avoiding tool, that he exists to get me out of pain, that his purpose is to make my life easy, if that's our perception of God, we will fall away because it's not real and it doesn't match reality. And what we see here, even as we've seen before in Mark, we see Christ leading his people into suffering. And that's not something we like to talk about or think about. Christ is leading his disciples into that suffering, and they don't, they don't want it. But he's warning them that his road of suffering and death was their road too. Not to the same extent because they would not be bearing the sins of the world as Christ would. And their death would not accomplish salvation for all who would believe as Christ's death would. But following Christ means following him to the cross because it's at the cross of Christ that self dies. And that's where our selves, selves, are put to death. Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem and he's leading the way and if the disciples choose to follow him, they have to go there too. There's no other way and no other option. Scene four brings us to the climax where Jesus again, in different words, yet he communicates the same ideas about true discipleship. He says to the disciples, you know, Gentile leaders, government officials, you know how they act. You know how the position and the power and the wealth that they wield. Yeah, 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 yeah. You want to be like that too? You want to be like that? No. Not so with you. I can't see anyone's heart. But I want, nevertheless, to ask you a question. How many of the politicians with whom you are familiar through the media How many of them do you imagine are in their current position out of a genuine, heartfelt desire, a self-sacrificing desire to serve their country and their people? Again, I cannot judge the heart. God does. But we see certain actions and we hear certain words that seem to show that the majority of them That's not their motivation. Their motivation is power for power's sake, authority for authority's sake. And Jesus, apparently, it was the same in his day because that's what the Gentile rulers were doing. And he says to his disciples, look at him, see him, see what they're doing, not you. And he's saying, I see this tendency in you guys. That's why you just asked me if you could be first and second in my kingdom. Because you're going after those same things. And he says, instead, the opposite is true. What the disciples saw as dichotomies and opposites, Jesus reveals as essential means. Position through service. Authority through slavery. Glory through death. And ease through suffering. You want to be great? Be small. Do you want to lead? serve. Do you want authority? Become a slave of all. And you see what this is? This is the continual and continued putting to death of self. Now, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We self-deceive. You self-deceive. We all self-deceive. We are, we deceive ourselves. We do that. And there's, there's a danger in this because our, our sinful, selfish hearts think, okay, so the way to power 
is by serving. Okay. Okay, okay. I can serve a little bit if it's going to get me that power. I think I've shared with you before, uh, you know, working on this mission ship for two years after high school, and the department that I was in was divided into three shifts. From the first day I started working there, this, you know, very mature 18-year-old, and I was like, I want to be a shift leader. But guys, from the very beginning, my motivation was purely self. I wanted that title, which seems like a really silly title, right? Shift leader, but that was my goal. I'm going to be a shift leader. And I'm going to tell other people what to do. And I was smart enough to know that the way to get that position was to work hard. So I did for about six months. I worked really hard. I volunteered for jobs that no one else wanted. I was cheerful about it. Worked extra hours, did everything. And finally, I got that coveted position, shift leader. And I was really bad at it. Really, I was because in retrospect, I look back and I see that from the moment that that position was given me, all service stopped in me. And it became all about my opportunity to tell others to go do those jobs that previously I was doing so that I could get to the position of telling others to go do the jobs that I didn't want to do in the first place, but which I did anyway, just so I could get the position to tell them what to do. Did you follow that? It's ugly. It's really ugly. And the irony with this is Jesus says, you want to be first and serve, but Christ knows. If our goal is still the power and the authority and we're just using the service and the self-sacrifice as a means to get there, the sacrifice won't be worth it. That's not the calling. The calling is that we love and serve Christ. And our focus is on him. You see, the focus in me was still self all along. It was still self. It wasn't Christ and it wasn't service. So the heart attitude of service to Christ is always to Christ. And then if Christ, in his wisdom, chooses to place us in positions of authority or power or recognition, our focus continues to be Christ. And in that position, we continue to serve because we're serving him and not self. How do we do that? That's really the question. That brings us to scene five, the resolution. The very last statement Jesus makes is the key to the whole passage. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Oh, that's beautiful. Notice how the passage, this whole passage is bracketed on both sides by this image of Christ leading. Leading to Jerusalem, to the cross at the beginning, and at the end, leading in service. He takes the first step. He is the one who didn't come to be served, but to serve. He is the one who lowered himself. He is the one who became human and took on human flesh and lived and died here. He leads. And one of the wonderful blessings and one of the incredible joys of knowing and following Christ is just that we don't have to figure out the path. We follow where Christ leads. My brother-in-law is a builder, and this summer I was, uh, I, uh, he was building in, in the evenings in his own time. He was building a little shed in the backyard of his parents' house. And Ethan and I just said, hey, you know, can we you want help? And he's like, sure. So we went with him to help. But I said to him very clearly, I was like, John, listen, what you're getting with us is completely unskilled labor. We have no skills. So you're going to have to tell us exactly what you want us to do. And that's what he did. I mean, even to the point of put a nail here. Okay. Now put one right here. Okay. You know, but that's the only way it would work. I couldn't figure out that path myself and I don't have to. And in our walk with Christ, the same is true. We don't have to figure that path out. We have to follow. I know that sometimes it's challenging to discern where Christ is going so that we are able to follow him. I understand that. But we don't have to figure out the path because God is God. 
and self is not. And only serving and loving Christ is sufficient. That is our goal. And it's in serving him and in loving him and in obeying him that self is put to death. And that's where our hope lies. That Christ has gone and continues to go before us. That we are following him. But note, he leads into suffering. He leads to the cross. And if we refuse his cup and his baptism, we will not be followers and we will not be disciples. If we are to be disciples, we follow him through. You know, an interesting phenomenon that occurred during these last two months when, when I was in the U.S. is that all my clothes shrank. <laughs> all of them. And I don't know if it was the Texas heat or, you know, the laundry detergent that's different there, but they all shrank. And you know what? You go online, you go on Facebook, you go on any other, you know, website. It's like these ads are constantly popping up or they're along the side that promise you weight loss with no effort. Yeah, you have to pay a few hundred dollars to learn the secret, but then after that, there's no effort. You take this pill, this one simple secret will revolutionize your life. You know what? Those are all scams. They're all scams. They're all lies because there's only one way to lose weight. And that's through suffering. <laughs> it is. It's through suffering. It's through self-denial. Denial of self, putting self to death. <laughs> I see some of you out there who are laughing and you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but the point I want to make is that to get in shape, to lose weight or whatever, there's only one way to do it. And it really is through self-denial. So to follow Christ, the same is true. We follow him where he leads. And he has shown us repeatedly in scripture that God is a God who at times actually leads his people into suffering, even as he's leading his disciples to Jerusalem, where it will begin an incredible incredible period of suffering in their lives. I mean, it it ebbed and and, and, and grew for, for some of them, but they all faced suffering. And I bring this up because I I, I take no joy in saying this. I I truly don't. I don't like saying it. I've told you this before. I don't enjoy it. But I do believe that suffering is coming. You know, the the, the church in the West has had a pass for, for centuries. We really have. We've had it fairly easy. And generally speaking, the world in the West has agreed, generally speaking, they've agreed with what we might call our moral code. They might not abide by it, but generally the world would agree that, yeah, that's right. And man, that's changing so fast. It already has changed. And so what's going to happen sooner rather than later is that those in the body of Christ who choose to follow him are going to face consequences for that in a way that we never have before in the West. Some of it's already come for some people. Some of it's coming. And we need to be prepared for that. The the disciples weren't. They're like, what? Suffering? You're going to be spit upon, flying, death? What? 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 Can I be first and second in your kingdom? We need to be prepared for that. I know that's not fun to think about. But if Christ leads you into suffering, will you follow? Or maybe for some of you, you already have followed and you're in the midst of suffering now or you have been in the past. Or, conversely, are you lusting after power and position and authority for the wrong reasons? What have you refused to hear in the gospel? Maybe it has been that you have refused to accept the reality that Jesus has told us that in this world we will have trouble. We have refused to to hear scripture um, when it says that self must die if we are to be disciples. So it kind of brings us back to that question of idolatry. What idols are you hanging on to that 
where, where self is just so wrapped into them that you absolutely refuse to put them to death. So once again, we are invited, and I include myself in this, we're invited to an opportunity, again, by the grace of God and by his great mercy, to repent, to receive the blessing of the truth that Christ has gone and continues to go ahead of us, his people. And you know, the primary foundational difference, or one of them, between Christianity and all other religions is that our God has gone through it first. So the idea of self being put to death may terrify us, but Jesus did it first. And he's not inviting us to go someplace that he has not already gone. He's not like the Gentile leaders that he was talking about there where they're sending people out to do these horrible, difficult things while they sit back in comfort. He leads and he's gone and we follow. Lord God, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us because we need it. We are all fallible. And self is insidiously active and desperately rearing its head in all of us. And we ask that by your mercy and grace, we would walk in obedience so that self would die. And you alone, Christ, would sit on the throne of our hearts. Have mercy on us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. As we continue